So here we have some hypothetical fitness testing data and the first step in its analysis is the um, assessment of reliability. We want to make sure the data we've collected is accurate enough for further analysis. So of course there'll be some variation between the trials, but we want to make sure that that variation is, is small. If it's too large, then we'd have to conclude that the inherent error uh, generated through the test, the tester, the athlete or the um, piece of equipment used uh, was so great that, that we cannot take this any further and we'd have to discard the data. So firstly we're going to look at systematic bias and we're going to visually represent that and we're going to do that by virtue of looking at the mean per trial uh, across uh, the three trials that we collected. So take calculate average, drag it across, and here is our uh, visual representation. So here we have uh, three trials from the counter movement jump, obviously one, two, and three, and we see that the trials are getting better. So uh, in terms of telling a story with regards to how we collected our data, we might conclude that the athletes were not familiar with the test and their full familiarization uh, was occurring during the test. So we wouldn't be too happy about that. We could also say that maybe they weren't warmed up enough. So as the body temperature got uh, warmer, uh, their performance increased. So we'd have to conclude that we need a much better warm up as well. Alternatively, um, and or it might be that motivation improved throughout the test, whether that be by virtue of competition between athletes or the tester providing um, more motivation towards the, the, the final trial. Obviously this is a hugely cruel assessment because we'd have to look at it with respect to the scores uh, on the y-axis but this is just to serve a, as an example. Let's just drag it across and have a look at the other tests. Let's pull this across. So now we've got the RSI here, so trial 1, 2 and 3 again and our crude assessment might be well actually now they're getting worse. Uh, so you want the RSI score to also be as high as possible. Could be that there was not enough rest period given as part of our protocol between trials. So there was some uh, fatigue generated that wasn't dissipated. So longer rest next time. It could be that motivation dwindled or contempt for the test itself was, was generated. So again, something to uh, address. I think the other, the other point is that perhaps the, the, the intervals between trials was actually so long that they actually got colder. So it's the opposite to, to then getting warm up, warming up and performance would uh, uh, deteriorate as a consequence of that. So let's look at the final one now. We'll look at pro agility. Here's our three trials. Well, the first two trials are pretty tight, we're quite happy, but the third trial was uh, was a lot longer. Obviously, with this being a speed-based test, we want it to be as short as possible. So some conclusions could be that while the, the rest was sufficient for trials one and two, uh, given how long it takes to complete the test, we need a lot longer, especially if we're trying to fit in three trials. Perhaps if you're on a, on a on running tight for time, you could say that actually this test just needs two trials to to run as well. So you know, in terms of uh, assessing the story of how we collected that data, um, I want to try and keep the trials as similar as possible and we can do that by ensuring the athletes are familiar with, with each test, uh, they're warmed up and also the motivation provided throughout stays uh, consistent. So there's our, our uh, look at systematic bias so now we're going to look at the coefficient of variation which will uh, describe that, that the difference or rather the, the variation between each athlete's uh, trials or the scores per trial and represent that as a, as a percentage so how we do that is we have to first uh, look at the standard deviation and then divide that by the mean so equal standard dev and we're going to do that per athlete. So divided by average. And then to get that as a percentage, we times the whole thing by 100. 
So there's 11% variation for this athlete's uh, scores, uh, their, their trials. Uh, and we can then pull that across. There would be obviously some fixing up we have to do here. So if I just pull, this will be the standard deviation, pull the average across. That fixes that one. And let's do the same for pro agility. Pull that right over, pull the average right over, and that fixes that. Highlight, double click on the box, and we have the coefficient of variation per athlete per test the whole way along. Now, really, if we're trying to present that as the as the, the test average or the for the squad, we want to get the average coefficient of variation across all the different athletes. And we have average down here, I can just pull that across. And here we have uh, the coefficient of variation for the test. Now you can see that each athlete actually uh, generates different scores, uh, and some are better than others, perhaps some are more familiar uh, than others to, to particular tests. Um, also, we can see that the RSI has the highest um, uh, coefficient of variation, so and typically ten, less than 10% is, is deemed acceptable, but Within fitness testing, perhaps less than five is uh, is what we should be aiming for. It's not such a surprise that the RSI is the one that struggled most, uh, given it's not really a innate uh, a movement. And um, although the pro agility requires some level of technique, because of the length of the test, and as the test gets longer, it will get more and more reliable. So. If we were going to use the RSI next time, and bear in mind we want to try and get that below 5%, we would have to conclude that we need to introduce it within training earlier so that come the time of fitness, there's no familiarization required, everyone's used to the test, and then we can adopt it as part of our practice. Okay.